Disease Epidemiology Seminar Series brought to you by the Center uh, for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, I'm Bradford and I will be your moderator for this session. I'm excited and honored to welcome Professor Craig McLean as our speaker today, who is at the University of Oxford. Professor McLean has a long-standing interest in understanding how ecological and genetic processes interact to drive adaptation in microbial populations. He obtained his doctorate at McGill University in 2004, where he invest investigated the causes of metabolic adaptive radiation and pseudomonas fluorescence using experimental evolution. He then did a postdoc at Imperial College London, where he investigated met metabolic cooperation and competition in yeast. In, yeast, sorry. in 2007, he moved to, to Oxford as a lecturer in the Department of Zoology and later established his research group after obtaining a university research fellowship from the Royal Society in 2009. His lab currently focuses on understanding the drivers of antibiotic resistance in clinical settings. Professor McLean's talk today is entitled Evolutionary Drivers of Antibiotic Resistance in Pathogenic Bacteria. So thank you very much for joining us and please take it away, Craig. Thank you. Good, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Brad. Uh, I wanna start by saying that I'm, <clears throat> I'm honored to be here uh, with you virtually. I just, I'm, it's too bad that I can't be there uh, in person. Um, anyway, okay, good. So Brad, I think you've given a, a fantastic introduction. Okay, so, I probably don't need to tell this to, to all of you, but for much of human history, bacterial infections have been a leading cause of disease and death. And I think one of actually the kind of most interesting ways of looking through this is actually, you know, when we look at things like Bruegel's The Triumph of Death, uh, showing the kind of, uh, the, the kind of social upheaval and destruction uh, that was caused by the plague in 16th century Antwerp. And uh, so much of the reason why uh, bacterial disease is no longer such a problem is uh, because of the use of antibiotics. <clears throat> and basically, uh, obviously, the use of antibiotics has driven the spread of resistance. And every talk that you ever go to on resistance has to have a figure that looks something like this, uh, where we see, uh, in this case, the rise of MRSA. Okay, so resistance really has emerged as an important global health problem. Okay, so the most recent estimates say that over a million uh, people die as a result of resistant infections every year. And uh, some people have argued that by the mid 21st century, uh, resistant infections may become a leading cause uh, of human death. Okay, so, so responding to, to resistance really is, I think, a, a kind of global scientific challenge. And so what we do in my lab, uh, what we've focused on in my lab for the last 13 years is studying the evolutionary biology uh, of antibiotic resistance. So really we're, we're interested in kind of asking big questions like, you know, what are the evolutionary drivers of resistance and, and how can we prevent resistance? And really we use approaches uh, that are from population biology and genomics uh, and microbiology to address these questions, okay? So I'm going to start by showing you a kind of simple cartoon model. Okay, this is what kind of how evolutionary biologists think about resistance. So the idea here is you've got a sensitive population. Okay, it's treated with antibiotics, and there is then selection for rare resistant variants. Okay, so we get the spread of resistance. The resistance comes at uh, fitness cost, okay, reduced competitive ability, reduced growth, et cetera. And that's why I've shown the resistant bacteria as being smaller. And so because of these costs, it's hard to understand how, resist how resistance can persist in the long term, because exposure to antibiotics is really very transient, okay, over long, over, over kind of evolutionary history. And so we might think that resistance will tend to be lost. One of the key insights from evolutionary studies of resistance has been that uh, bacteria can evolve compensatory adaptations, okay, that offset the costs associated with resistance. And this then allows resistance to be stably maintained even in the absence of antibiotic use. Okay, so we're at, the, we're at a point now where we've got this really nice kind of mature conceptual framework for understanding the evolution of resistance. But really where this conceptual framework comes from is it comes from test tube experiments and mathematical models, okay? And so these approaches are really great for understanding, you know, the basic processes that drive the spread of resistance. But the problem is in connecting these with the patterns of resistance in the real world. And what we really don't know at this point, or that we don't have a very good handle on, is to what extent these patterns of, of resistance in the real world reflect these processes. And this is, this is what I call the AMR gap, okay? And today I'm gonna to be talking about really 
uh, the, the focus of my lab has been for the last six years, has been trying to bridge this gap by saying, what are the processes driving AMR in kind of real world pathogen populations? So the first project I'm gonna to talk to you about is about resistance during infections, okay? So really, uh, uh, so it, it, infections in hospitalized patients is one of the biggest burdens of resistance. And we know a lot about the clinical risk factors that predispose people to acquiring resistant infections, but the underlying population biology that goes on in infected hosts remains poorly understood. And the kind of model that people have here is that a single clone colonizes the patient or starts the infection and resistance evolves as a result of selection for variants that are acquired de novo during the infection. Okay, and we've been interested in testing this um, in using Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, so this is a, an opportunistic pathogen um, that's a really kind of leading cause of hospital acquired uh, infections, especially in kind of immunocompromised and critically ill patients. And it can cause infections at a bunch of sites, but really it's infections of the respiratory tract, okay, that are, that are very dangerous. And so we've been studying this in the context of a, of a really big kind of European-wide consortium project uh, called Combact and Agnet. And one of the neat things that we got them to do in this, okay, when they were isolating Pseudomonas from patient samples was instead of, you know, choosing a single bacterial isolate per sample, we got them to choose 12, okay? And we use this diversity to infer evolutionary processes. Okay. And before I want to go on, I just want to mention this work really in my, led, uh, in my lab was led by Julio Diaz, uh, Rachel Wheatley, and Natalia Kappel, all of whom did a fantastic job on this project. So I'm going to show you first a case study okay, in one patient. Okay, so this is somebody who came uh, basically in intensive care, developed pseudomonas pneumonia, a, a very serious infection. Okay. So this is showing that the titer of, of bacteria in their lung and they also, their guts were also colonized with pseudomonas. Okay, so they were treated with this antibiotic mirapenem, and this drove basically the population crashed down to the point where it was undetectable. But then after a few days, we started to see a recovery of the pseudomonas aeruginosa population and actually recolonization of the, of the kind of lung microbiome. Okay, so we, we got about 100 isolates from this patient. The first thing we did was we resistance phenotyped them. Okay, so this is showing mirapenem resistance. And what you can see is basically, so this is the clinical breakpoint here. Uh, nothing really went on in the gut, but in the lung, resistance shot up and then really quickly went down. Okay, so very rapid rise and fall of resistance. So we were really interested in understanding the evolutionary drivers of this. Okay, um, so we basically, so this, uh, so we, we kind of sequenced uh, we, uh, kind of one of the initial isolates. Okay, and so we got this closed reference genome. This is a, something for the Pseudomonas aficionados, this is ST17. Okay, this is an XDR isolate. It's got loads of chromosomal resistance mutations and also has a plasmid that has a few resistance genes on it. Uh, and what, so what this is meant to show here was the phylogeny of all of the isolates from this patient. Okay, and the first thing you can see, so this is the day they were isolated on and this is their mirapenem resistance. And you can see that there are quite a few origins uh, of elevated mirapenem resistance, okay? The first thing we see is this high level mirapenem resistance, and that's as a result of mutations in OPRD. So this is a porin, okay? These mutations block mirapenem from getting into the cell. <clears throat> we also see mutations in a gene called WBPM. Okay, it does very much the same thing. <clears throat> but if you look closely, you see actually, we also see some things, so this is the ancestor here, we also see some strains actually that have lower mirapenem resistance, okay? And these have mutations in uh, MEX-AB, okay? This is an efflux pump that pumps antibiotics out of the cell. So what this phylogeny shows is that we're actually seeing in this patient, okay, we're seeing de novo evolution, both of kind of new resistance mutations, but actually also of anti-resistance. And so what we did is we kind of we, we, we put this data together okay, on, the, on the titer of bacteria in the lung and also on the, on, the, on the frequency of different mutants in something called a Muller plot. And that's shown here. Okay? So, so the width here shows kind of log titer. Okay? And this is time going this way. So here we see this ancestral clone. It's hit with mirapenem. The population crashes. And then when it recovers, what we see are, are things that have mutations in OPRD and WBPM. Okay. And so these have elevated resistance that we see over here. And interestingly, the WBPM mutant also has a higher growth rate. 
Okay, so this is growth rate measured in the, in the absence of any antibiotics. And then over time, okay, what we see is that actually then there's selection for these MEX-AB OPRM mutants. Okay, these have higher high growth rate, but low miropenem resistance. And they actually end up basically eliminating these OPRD mutants. And so this is what drives then the fall of resistance. So this is really neat, okay? What this case study shows is that actually selection can drive both the rapid rise and fall of resistance. And it's interesting that we find these, you know, these things that have actually anti-resistance mutations. And what we speculate is that these are the descendants of cells that kind of effectively escaped miropenem treatment in some kind of refugium in the lung that, that miropenem could not get to. So I'm gonna show you another case study now. Yeah, and this is one where, there's, where the ecology that's going on is a little bit more complex. So again, this is from a single patient. And this is a patient where we don't have any quantitative data on pseudomonas abundance, but it's a patient who, when they were in hospital, okay, had this kind of interesting variable pattern of colonization of the lungs and the gut. And again, this patient was treated with miropenem. Okay, this is actually a bystander effect. So this was, treat, this was miropenem treatment for a suspected uh, urinary tract infection. Okay, and again, if we look at resistance, we see here's the window and there's miropenem treatment going on. And then afterwards, we see that resistance shoots up both in the gut and the lung. And this is, you know, if we look back at this pattern, it suggests that there's something going on here with the gut and the lung, but it's, it's unclear. And this is the type of thing that if you don't know anything actually about the structure of the bacterial population is very difficult to interpret. So here again, so here we sequenced about 60 isolates. And here actually we have, we have a kind of richer phylogeny, okay? So here we've, we see all of the isolates and here it's whether, whether, they're, is, whether they're isolated from the gut and the lung, okay? And so what we would infer from this phylogeny is that actually this patient was colonized, the gut of this patient was colonized by a single clone of Pseudomonas and that actually there were two separate instances of gut to lung transmission. Um, this is something that's really interesting uh, especially for people who are in, in the kind of pseudomonas community. So we've known for a long time that gut colonization is a, an important clinical risk factor for the development of lung infections. Um, but, it's, but it's really, no, it's, it's been unclear why. There's been no evidence actually of gut to lung transmission. But here we can see by, you know, by reconstructing the phylogeny of these isolates, we can see quite, you know, we can see very good evidence of this. And this shows actually the, the uh, kind of accumulation of variants in this patient over time. We get a very nice molecular clock. Okay, and one of the really interesting things here is that this is very fast. Okay, so here, this population is accumulating SNPs at a rate of about 50 per year. And that's about 10 times higher than most pathogens. Now this isn't actually, this isn't because these are hypermutators. When we test them in the lab, they have a perfectly normal uh, mutation rate. What it's saying is that the in vivo mutation rate of pseudomonas is very high. And this is great for this type of study because it generates this phylogenetic signal, okay? Good, so now I've, I've now shown here part of this phylogeny again, but where we've mapped on miropenem resistance for the isolates. And what we can immediately see, okay, is that there's actually two independent evolutionary origins of miropenem resistance. One in the, one in the lungs, and one in the gut. And what's interesting is we know that miropenem concentrations are high in the lung and low in the gut. And kind of interestingly, we see that in the lung, high level resistance evolves and in the gut, low level resistance evolves, suggesting that actually, you know, the, the bacterial population is adapting to differences in antibiotic pressure really at, a, at the scale of different host tissues. Um, so what we then did is then we did a bunch of amplicon sequencing Okay, to really better track the dynamics of this lung associated clade and this gut associated clade. And so this again, here, this is our, this is our mirror penum treatment window. And what we see here is actually this lung associated clade. Okay, the frequency shoots up, effectively goes to fixation and then stays there. And what this is showing, there's actually a little hint here. There's actually a little bit of secondary lung to gut transmission of this resistant lineage that goes on. Okay, and here's the gut lineage. And again, we see it shoots up to about frequency of one in the gut, but then it goes down. Okay, so we're seeing resistance here being stable in the lung, but less stable in the gut. And, and actually by day 30, it's gone. Okay, it disappears. So to understand why, we analyzed, we tested the fitness of the kind of 
kind of wild type strains and also these resistant mutants, okay, under aerobic conditions and anaerobic conditions. So Pseudomonas likes oxygen and we think that, you know, anaerobic conditions is one of the main stressors it'll encounter in the gut. And what's really interesting here is we see that this OPRD mediated resistance. So, and it's the same for these two different, these two different lineages. We see no fitness cost of this under aerobic conditions, but under anaerobic conditions, we see a clear cost. Okay. And this may explain why it's lost in the gut. So case studies like this are great. And I could probably talk about them all day. Um, but the problem is there are always, there, there are always questions about the generality of the inferences that you can draw. And so this is pseudomonas diversity at a bigger picture from this, from this project. Okay, so here it's 38 patients from 12 hospitals and the kind of eerie number of 666 isolates. Okay. And when we look at this level, this is the phylogeny of pseudomonas that we see. So we see that it's composed of really clearly differentiated strains. Okay, and if we look at this level, resistance, so here this is just the kind of percentage of MDR isolates, is really basically a bimodally distributed phenotype. So we see these, these some really resistant lineages like SD235, and we see some sensitive lineages as well. And for the kind of pseudomonas aficionados, I've included the model strains as kind of reference points in this phylogeny. But what about within hosts, okay? So, so the model of infection that we have for opportunistic pathogens is that there's some diversity of them out there and that sometimes a, a lucky clone gets into the lung and causes an infection, okay? So the idea is that within hosts, they should be clonal as in the two examples that I've just shown you. So this, what this shows is actually, so each little pie chart here is an individual patient, okay? And the colors just represent different strains. And the, really the key takeaway from this is that actually polyclonal infections here are quite common, okay? So even with you know, sampling a modest number of isolates per patient, we find that about th more than 30% of infections are polyclonal, okay? And so these tend to be in this hospital in Serbia with a high infection rate, but we also see them here in Hungary, uh, in Estonia, and actually in a very good uh, hospital in the Netherlands. So, one of the key predictions from evolutionary theory is that having is that increasing diversity is going to accelerate the rate of evolution because there's more genetic variation for selection to act on. So does pathogen diversity accelerate the evolution of resistance? Okay, so to address this, we had we looked in the detail at about 13 patients where we had longitudinal sampling before and after antibiotic treatment. Okay, and we just measured the change in resistance in response to treatment. And what you can see is that there's a really big difference between these monoclonal and polyclonal patients, okay? So the, the last examples I showed you, there was resistance did evolve, but actually it's, it's clear that, it, uh, that resistance really increases much more in response to treatment when they're in patients with polyclonal infections than monoclonal infections. But why? Okay, so to, to address this, we kind of took this increase here and for five patients, okay, we could really partition out this contribution to increased resistance purely statistically, okay, we could contribute, we should, could partition out this increase in resistance into effects of novel mutations and pre-existing diversity. And you see that basically it's really, the, the really key driver here is pre-existing diversity. I'm going to show you an example of this, okay, so this is from one patient that was sampled at two points, okay, about two weeks apart. And each of these colors here, to give you an idea of how crazy the antibiotic treatment that some of these patients get here, each color here represents a different antibiotic that the patient was treated with. And this is showing the, the composition of the population at these two time points, all right, and whether these strains are MDR or non-MDR. And what we just see here is that, look, when this, at the, at the start of treatment, there's this already ST235 MDR strain. And basically what happens is there's just selection for this pre-existing strain, okay? So this is much more typical than the kind of case studies that I showed you earlier on. Good, okay. So this is when I really deviate from what is in the abstract, okay? I think in the abstract, I said I was gonna talk about Pseudomonas, but now is actually where we leave Pseudomonas behind. Um, because between when I submitted my abstract and now, we actually had a, a bunch of interesting results in another project, and it really started to come together. And so this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my time. Okay, and so this is all about the stabilization of resistance. 
All right. So I want to go start by kind of coming back to this theoretical model that I showed you, where we've got selection for resistance. And then if resistance is costly over the long term, it gets stabilized. And this key evolutionary, uh, sorry, gets lost in this key evolutionary insight that compensatory evolution can stabilize resistance. Okay. So we know there's been a lot of work done on this in experiments, okay, and in, in, in mathematical modeling as well. But we really understand very little about how stable, how common compensatory evolution is in, in the real world and how stable resistance is, okay, with the exception of some great work that has been done in TB, okay. But other than that, we don't really know. And so this has been one of the things that's really interested me in the, in the AMR field for a long time. How can resistance persist given its cost? And so the key insight here from evolution, from evolutionary studies is that compensatory evolution can stabilize resistance. And to, address, to, to kind of test this, we've been working with colistin resistance, okay? So colistin uh, is an antibiotic that was discovered a long time ago, and that was used very heavily uh, as a growth promoter in agriculture, okay, especially in Asia but over time became more and more important as a last resort antibiotic to treat uh, infections caused by multi-drug resistant pathogens, okay? So colistin was used in this way uh, for a while, uh, for, for decades really, without much detectable resistance. And then all of a sudden, very rapidly, there was the spread of colistin resistance in, in, in E. coli, okay? And colistin resistance in this case is conferred by this gene called MCR1, okay? It's on this little mobile, it's on, or it was initially on this transposon, and this transposon has moved between plasmids and these plasmids have moved be be between strains. So when colistin resistance shot up, it wasn't one strain, okay? It was this, this MCR1 cassette that was spread across many plasmids and many strains. So the response to this, okay, was to ban the use, in China at least, was to ban the use of colistin as a growth promoter. There was a kind of very sudden 90% reduction in colistin consumption. Okay, so colistin resistance, MCR1 carries big fitness costs. Okay, so it can be as high as 30% in the lab. So the real question is here is how can colistin resistance persist given these huge costs? Okay, so this, this ban on the use of colistin as a growth promoter is, is really is, gives us a really unique way to address this question. Okay, and so a, a bunch of people have worked on this in my lab, but I really want to highlight the work done by Lois Ogunlana. Pramod Jangir, Liam Shaw, and Celia Souk, who's now actually a postdoc at Harvard. Okay, good. So this is the uh, MCR1, uh, this is the, the kind of MCR1 transposon and some work that was done uh, in this excellent paper. Uh, I identified this region just upstream of MCR1 as a polymorphism hotspot. Okay, so it has the statistical signatures and a positive selection. So we went in and we kind of recreated all of the mutations, okay, that, that are found here and measured their effects on fitness in the absence of colistin. Okay, so here we see this is, you know, a fitness of one here is a colistin sensitive strain. Here we see this about 30% cost of colistin resistance. Okay, it does vary a bit between strains, but it's, it's usually quite, quite costly. And what's clear is that these mutations are compensatory. Okay, they compensate for the costs. And the way they do this is actually really simple. They decrease the expression of MCR1. Okay, so here's fitness and expression with these mutants and the and the uh, and the uh, and the and the, <clears throat> and the controls that either express MCR1 or that don't express MCR1. Okay. Good. So this is interesting, but does it stabilize colistin resistance? Okay, so the model we have for colistin resistance is very much that it spreads from agriculture to people. Okay, this is where the colistin gets used and the spread of colistin resistance, both directly to humans and indirectly. And so um, we actually looked, uh, we kind of combined, I guess, or we looked actually in some epidemiological data from, uh, from pigs, okay? So there's been a lot of sampling of MCR1 that's been done. And this is, we see, uh, so these compensatory mutations and things that lack them. So I they have a wild type regulatory sequence before and after the colistin band. And what we can see here is that actually, yes, this, the, the compensatory mutation increase, or these compensatory mutations increase the stability uh, of MCR1. Okay, so there's evidence here that compensatory evolution is important. But there's clearly a real difference here. Okay, so on the slide that I showed you before, there are these really big effects of MCR1 on fitness. But, you know, actually what this, 
this rate of decline in MCR1, either with it's compensated or wild type in the real world, suggests that actually these fitness differences in the real world are very weak. So what else? What else could it be that actually impacts the fitness or the success of colistin resistance? So colistin is positively charged, okay? And this helps it attack bacteria, okay? So bacteria have this negative charge. And what MCR does is it actually reduces the negative charge on the cell, reducing the affinity of colistin for bacteria. Now, what's important is that actually, so antimicrobial peptides play a really key role in the host uh, in immune systems. And they're also very positively charged. And they also rely on this electrostatic interaction to attack bacteria. So this suggested to us that actually MCR might provide resistance to host antimicrobials. Okay, so here we tested this. So here we've measured the fitness of MCR relative to a MCR-free control strain. Okay, in the presence of a bunch of peptides. So here, this is colistin as a control. And these are peptides that are produced by humans, uh, pigs, and chickens. And the key point is that MCR1 increases or is selectively advantageous here. Okay, not as much as with colistin, but there's still a big advantage. Okay, and this is showing this at a more broadly. Okay, so what we did here is we, we looked at more peptides. And here we measured kind of the resistance uh, of, of different plasmids, different variants of MCR1 to, to these host antimicrobials. We see there's some cases, okay, so blue is increased resistance, red is increased sensitivity. There's some peptides like PR39, okay, that, M, that MCR1 makes bacteria more resistant to, but on the whole, there's a lot more blue than red in this picture, okay? MCR1 increases resistance to host, anti, to host antimicrobials. And I think there's a real lesson in here, okay? So, so uh, anti antimicrobial peptides are kind of widely touted as one of the solutions to the AMR crisis. And what we see here is how the anthropogenic use of uh, antimicrobial peptides can drive the evolution of resistance to the uh, innate immune systems of people and animals. Okay, so suggesting actually we really need to be cautious about using antimicrobial peptides therapeutically. Good, I just realized I've been speaking too quickly. So I'm gonna slow down a little bit. Okay, so now we're gonna move on um, to look at infectious transfer, okay? So like many AMR genes, MCR1 is carried on plasmids, all right? And so these plasmids, uh, is certainly an enteric bacteria, usually transfer between strains and species as a result of conjugation. Okay, so here we see horizontal transfer of a plasmid from one strain to the next strain. And so what this allows, does, is it lets plasmids spread infectiously. Okay, so this is an additional, uh, this can also, of course, in theory, drive the spread of resistance genes. So what I'm showing you here is a phylogeny of one of the, um, one of the main plasmids that carries MCR1, okay, INCX4. And um, it's a kind of odd looking phylogeny because there isn't very much genetic variation. But what all of these colors represent is different host strains of E. coli. And the take home from this is that essentially this looks like a rainbow, okay? So we see that this plasmid is really spread across a lot of different st strains of E. coli, suggesting effectively that it's very promiscuous, okay? And so we're interested in actually understanding how this ability to transfer via conjugation impacts the, the maintenance of MCR1. So what we did is we actually constructed some plasmids, okay? These were mobilizable plasmids that were containing MCR1 that were either conjugative or non-conjugative. And MCR1 under these conditions is associated with big fitness costs. But when you put it on a conjugative plasmid, it can be maintained more or less stably, okay? So this is propagating these in the absence of, uh, of any colistin. But when you take the same plasmid, same fitness cost, and you make it non-conjugative, you get a very rapid loss, okay, of, of MCR1. And so this really, what this really highlights is how infectious transfer can really help to stabilize these mobile elements, okay? Good. So I wanna go back now to something that I showed you that's, uh, that's, I guess, biophysical, okay? And that's this idea. So conjugation relies on direct cell-to-cell -cell contact. My guess is these cells, this is probably actually far apart, okay? Normally cells are really in very close proximity uh, to each other when they're undergoing conjugation. And so if we look at something like wild type, 
E. coli, okay, it's got this negative charge on it. And so that's going to generate electrostatic repulsion between cells. And so if we have MCR, we'll have less negative charge, less negative, and therefore less negative, excuse me, less electrostatic repulsion. This suggests there should be higher conjugation. Okay, and so when we measure this, we can actually see that the, the MCR1 gene itself, okay, increases the conjugation rate of plasmids by about three times. And I've showed you here a really cherry picked image. Okay, so normally E. coli uh, grows as uh, under, under kind of standard lab conditions, really as single isolated cells. But this shows what can happen when you really express MCR1, you've actually got E. coli growing as a big ball of cells. As I said, this is cherry picked, but I don't think it's hard to you know, imagine why conjugation rates would be much higher when you have cells growing like this, as opposed to, as opposed to kind of being solitary. And so we wanted to understand how much this MCR1 effect actually contributes or to, to, to horizontal transfer. Okay, and so what we did here is again, we made some plasmids here. We've got our a plas a conjugative plasmid with MCR1 on it. And now we took the same plasmid, it's still conjugative, but we inactivated MCR1, okay? So inactivating MCR1 gets rid of the fitness cost, but the plasmid is now much less stable, okay? Because, because of this reduced conjugation rate, all right? So this really shows that actually in spite of its costs, in spite of the costs associated with MCR1, it really can increase plasmid stability through increased conjugation. Okay, good. Okay, In the, so now we've now come to the last part of the talk. Okay, and so MCR1 um, provides uh, colistin resistance that's kind of, it's borderline clinically significant. But actually when you look in colistin, in colistin resistant clinical isolates, you see that much of them have much higher colistin resistance. So the question then is how does E. coli evolve high level colistin resistance? Okay, and so to address this, we did an experimental evolution study. Okay, so this is very much my, my background, this kind of a bread and butter from, from my lab. And here we took populations of E. coli that were identical. So we took a wild type population and a population that had uh, a kind of naturally occurring MCR1 plasmid on it. And here we had, I think, 60 populations of each of these strains. And every day you double the concentration of colistin and you just measure whether the populations are viable or not, okay? And so the longer they can persist, the more evolvable they are. And at this point here on day four, this is the day when the, when the colistin hits the minimal inhibitory concentration, okay? So if there's no evolution, this is the day you expect populations to go extinct on. And this is exactly what you see with wild type E. coli. It really struggles to evolve resistance to colistin, okay? Basically almost all the populations went extinct this day. Versus with MCR1, okay, even though the, the doses were, were higher, okay, they consistently evolved high level colistin resistance. Okay? And, and so to understand why, we took a bunch of these evolved populations and we sequenced them. And when we did that, we found that basically these evolved populations, almost all of them had a single SNP in this gene here, LPXC. Okay, this is a, an essential gene involved in LPS biosynthesis. See these kind of two clusters of mutations. So to understand the role of this plays, we reconstructed this mutation, okay? So in a wild type background, and here in a wild type background, you see that an LPXC mutation actually decreases colistin resistance. But when there's MCR1 there, the LPXC mutation actually really in or it increases, it about doubles colistin resistance. So in other words, there's this epistatic interaction between MCR1 and LPXC. Okay, very clear. We then looked in some data. Okay, these are MCR positive clinical or isolates from China from clinical and environmental sources. And this is showing their uh, uh, LPXC polymorphisms basically. And the key thing that we see here is that in infections, so pathogenic E. coli, okay, uh, have a higher frequency of mutations in LPXC, okay, than colonized patients or than these, these other samples. But the real question here, in our, la in our experiments, we artificially made MCR1 come first, okay? So in the real world, what came first, M M MCR1 or LPXC? And so to do this, we looked at the diversity uh, of uh, LPXC across E. coli, okay? And the key thing I wanna highlight here 
is that L LPXC polymorphisms are most common in this B2 phyla group. Okay, so this is a kind of pathogen E phyla group of, of, of E. coli. Okay, or this is, I guess, more accurately, this is a phyla group of E. coli that is enriched in pathogens. So this is this is really interesting, and what's especially interesting is that actually, so this doesn't this doesn't reflect uh, higher overall levels of genetic diversity. Okay, this is specific to LPXC. But what's really interesting is we see this in pop populations of E. coli. So these are from kind of clinical, environmental, agricultural sources in the UK, where there's never been any history of, of MCR1. Okay, so what this suggests is that, so we know that MCR1 has spread by horizontal gene transfer from commensal strains or, or pig associated strains, more precisely, into pathogens. And what this shows is that actually there was this uh, pre-existing diversity in pathogens, okay, pre-existing diversity in LPXC that essentially primed them to, to, to evolve high-level colistin resistance by acquiring MCR1 by horizontal gene transfer. In other words, in the real, in our experiments, when MCR1 and then LPXC, but in the real world, it looks like it was mainly LPXC and then MCR1, okay? So this is the end of my talk. And so what I want to finish off by, by speaking about really is, is, you know, where this field is heading. And, you know, if we're going to have interventions, okay, that really combat AMR in the real world, we need to understand about what drives AMR, okay, in, in pathogen populations. So in the, in, the, in the first part of the talk, I talked about selection for resistance in patients, and the kind of evolutionary model there really has been de novo evolution. And we see some clear examples of this. But the key insight from our work here is that really the most important driver of resistance in patients is not de novo evolution, it's selection on standing diversity, okay, pre-existing resistant strains. And so what that says is, you know, we need to have interventions actually that limit the ability of these resistant strains to colonize patients. In the second part of the talk, we looked at, you know, at the stability, or the question was what, what or how stable is resistance? And what we can see is MCR1 resistance is stable. And it's stable for a bunch of reasons, for compensatory adaptation, because it confers resistance to host peptides, and because of horizontal transfer. And what this means is if we really want things like this to go away, we want resistance like this to go away, reducing antibiotic consumption alone is probably not going to be enough. And that we need interventions like population genetic engineering that are actually gonna go out there and actively eliminate these resistance genes from pathogen populations, okay? So I wanna just thank, uh, thank everybody who's been in my lab for the last six years while we were working on this. I've highlighted people as I've gone through the talk, but obviously there's a big thanks to everybody and to our, and to our collaborators here. And these are, these are the people who've been kind enough to fund this work. And if you want to, to listen to what I have to say about AMR, you can follow me on Twitter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, terrific talk, Professor McLean. Um, I mean, the electrostatic repulsion and HGT, HGT is just that's fascinating. Um, so we'll, we'll now take questions. Um, we'll try our can best. I, can, I, can, I, oh, sorry, yeah. Brad, can I stop my screen share? Oh, um, yeah, maybe the um, technical moderators can help. Or yeah, you, you can, no, no, you can do that. Okay, you, you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. There we go. Good. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we will try our best to accommodate uh, as many questions as we can, uh, but if your question doesn't get covered, uh, please feel free to reach out to our speaker directly. Um, remember to submit your questions to Lorado via the chat function. Um, okay, so I know that we have some questions already. Um, Vikram Parikh asks, um, what is the basis behind the selection on uh, antimicrobial peptides? Yeah, so... Vikram, apologies if I didn't make it uh, clear in my talk. The idea is basically that these peptides fundamentally work in the same way, or they share some similarities in terms of how they attack bacteria with colistin. So because of that, MCR1, which provides resistance to colistin, also provides resistance to these host antimicrobial peptides. And that's why it's selectively advantageous in the presence of those peptides. Cool, thank you. Um... Then there's another question from uh, Martin Fenk. 
Um, when you have talked about the gut to lung transmission study, you showed the phylogenetic tree showing the gut to lung transmission of Pseudomonas ruginosa. Could you explain in more detail why you think that the upper lung isolates have been transmitted from the gut? Uh, wouldn't it be also possible that the lung was the initial location for colonization of that patient and the gut was a refuge before reinfecting the patient? Yeah, okay. So you're right. There could be there could be lots of, of scenarios. Okay, and so what we're saying here is what is the most parsimonious scenario? And the most parsimonious scenario, given that phylogeny, is initial colonization of the gut. And and the, the inference of the first gut to lung transmission event depends on that assumption, but the inference of the second one doesn't. Because that second, the key thing, the kind of smoking gun, okay, I'm not going to go back to my slides because I'm kind of awkward with screen sharing and stuff. So I'll show you here. Okay, so the key thing is that that second gut to lung transmission event, you've got a clade of lung isolates that are nested. Okay, so in that phylogeny on either side, there are gut isolates on, on either side of the lung ones. And that's a real smoking gun uh, of, of transmission. Exactly. Cool. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Uh, so Yu Nang asks, um, uh, could you comment on AMR and the small colony variant um, subpopulations uh, commonly seen in medical device related infections or cystic fibrosis? Uh, there are emergence under pressure from long term exposure to antibiotics. So I guess, yeah, any comments on small colony variant subpopulations? Ooh, um... Not, not really. The one comment I would make is a few years ago, we did a, a meta-analysis of fitness costs associated with resistance. And those actually really come out as an outlier. That is clearly the most expensive form of resistance. So my comment, I guess, would be given that high cost, it's something that we would only expect if there's lots of, uh, of antimicrobial pressure, basically. That's, yeah. But gotcha. it's not something I've thought a lot about. Gotcha. Um... Another question from Tika Galvao. Uh, they, first off, they thank you for a great talk. And um, okay. they ask, why would you say no colostin resistance arose in your in vitro evolution without M MCR1? The cost of MGRB, uh, FOB PQ, and PMRAB mutations would be too high in your culture conditions. Would they be too high in your culture conditions? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Probably, I mean, we're really selecting strongly for colistin resistance here. So, you know, when you're really selecting strongly, what it resistance is under much stronger selection than it, than, it, than its costs. Um, so, it could be that they, that you know, it is possible that the costs are absolutely prohibitive, or it could be that the mutation rate is too low given those conditions. The most important thing, okay, is not the absolute. Oh, you know, wild type E. coli didn't evolve resistance. It's that there's that obvious huge difference, okay? When there's MCR1, they always evolve resistance in those experiments. So there's this massive difference when you do or don't have MCR1. Cool. Um, then there's another question from Qingxi Wang. Uh, and I really like this question. I'm gonna piggyback off of it a bit. So they ask, um, they're wondering if bacteriophage are able to involve uh, HGT in the transfer of MCR1, so transduction. Um, and I guess I can piggyback off of that if there's any, like, if you have intuition with regards to how the electro electrostatic changes would affect transduc transduction or those modes. That's a good modes. question. I hadn't thought about it, but I bet they do. Yeah. Um, so there's evidence out there that MCR1 actually also resists, also alters uh, uh, resistance to phage. Um, and that's to be expected because they bind to LPS. So a really good question, something I haven't thought about. If, if, you, if you're asking my opinion, okay, I think uh, there's been some really excellent work that's been done in the last few years. I'm thinking especially of work by Jose Pinades, really showing that transduction can occur at very high frequencies, much higher actually than, than rates that we think of of conjugation. And I think overall, that we've underappreciated the role that transduction plays in the movement of plasmids. Okay, and, and there's there, there's just there's just a bunch of evidence that supports that. But how MCR one impacts it is a very good question, and it's not something I've really thought much about. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I think that's. I guess I had a, a few other questions. I was interested with um, with MTR one uh, whether also you saw any because um, you talked about how. 
there's changes in sort of MTR1 expression affecting um, you know, the phenotype, obviously. Um, and I was wondering if you saw changes in the plasmid cop copy number associated with any of those, or if you guys investigate that a bit. Yeah, no, no. So, so th that, so this is another uh, thing I think is underappreciated is actually the role of plasmid copy number plasticity and plasmid copy number variation. So actually in that first patient case study I showed, and it was one of the last slides that I deleted when I was kind of trimming down for this talk, there was actually a plasmid whose copy number really went down after, that had, that had a carbapenemase on it and whose copy number really went down after um, after after meropenem treatment. So it's something in the, in the context of MCR1, the plasmids that we have have fairly stable copy number, okay? And some of those are like five, others of them are more like two, and that says fairly stable. But the interesting angle here is that selection for compensatory mutations is probably actually much stronger when you're on a high copy number plasmid, so five relative to, to two. Gotcha. Um, and then I guess I had one further question, I believe, um, which is also for me. Um, so when you showed that E. coli phylogeny um, with yeah. um, uh, showing kind of like the, the, the you know, that star, almost star-like and, and the diversity, I was wondering what the ecology, like where, where the, I, I might've missed the, just where, where did those um, E. coli were sampled if they're all maybe from the same hospital environment? So, no, those are from sample. Those are from pig farms. Uh, oh, from pig farms. Oh, diversity. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. That was all from, sorry, I should have said that. I didn't, it, it, that, that, did. that's, I that's, it. From, that's from pig farms okay. and there's a huge diversity. So I think those were sampled from uh, about 50 different pig farms in China. So all of the data okay. that showed on the prevalence of pigs or on all of the pig stuff, I think it's from 50 uh, pig farms in a few provinces of China, and it's the epidemiological data was based on thousands of pigs per year. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, all right, I don't see any further questions. Um, so um, I guess we can just finish this off a little early. I think Yonatan oh. had a couple Yonatan. questions. Oh, yeah, Yonatan, Yonatan had a question. Please, Yonatan, take it away. So, so Craig, fantastic talk. Uh, one, wonderful to, to hear about what you've been up to recently and looking forward to chatting a little bit more later. Um, so I had a couple of questions about uh, stabilized or increasing resistance yeah. in, in a population level. So in, in one of your first slides, you showed the steady rise of MRSA in a population going up to about 2010, which is also about when it started to decline. So I was wondering if you could speculate as to, you know, knowing that there are forces to stabilize resistance and with compensatory mutations and so on, why were we seeing and continue to see a decline in MRSA? So that's one, one question. And then uh, relatedly, you had mentioned um, in the end, this idea of engineering approaches to deal with this kind of stabilized resistance or resistance, uh, resistance isolates that have compensatory mutations and that seem more fit. So I'm, I'm really curious what, what kinds of engineering approaches you're thinking of. Uh, for, for that and I want to point out, I knew Yonatan was going to ask the first question, and I wanted to ask the second one. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Oof, that's uh, okay. That's, that's 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 a lot of questions you've asked. So I'll talk about the MRSA one. Okay, that is, I just cherry picked that to show a picture of resistance going up. I think it's misleading to say what is the fraction of MRSA because actually, if you look at a genetic level, that isn't one epidemic; it's multiple epidemics that are happening. Okay, so you know, initially you had ST two three nine MRSA, which which really rose, and then it went down. And I didn't show it today, but we've actually done some work. That's MRSA. That has the biggest SCC mech element. Okay, and it was acquired in this kind of big kind of chromosomal hybridization event. And so that's actually very costly. And so we think that's why it's gone down. And then you've had others that have come up. So there's actually lots of dynamics that are going on there. And just to say MRSA is misleading because it's a phenotype versus really, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, what you're interested in is the actual, the, the, under, the strains that are underlying that. So, you know, it's just something I cherry pick to show resistance going up and every talk has, has them on that. Um, Okay, the second bit about the things, the engineering approaches have to be, I wanna be a little bit careful when I'm answering this because I've got lots of collaborators and I'm not sure how much they want me to discuss different bits of it, okay? So, so what I will say, okay, is we've got a kind of consortium project where what we're, what we're trying to do is to actually target the mobile uh, is to really take advantage of the mobility to try and target AMR. 
So with, with interventions that are aimed at, that are either uh, what I would call, um, and this is where I, I don't want to go into more details, but that I'll call assistant sequence specific antimicrobials that get in there and, and either destroy plasmids carrying resistance genes or kill the bacteria. Um, but the other much more low tech thing that we're actually trying to do is we're trying to use pilus dependent bacteriophage okay, to, to, to get rid of AMR and bacterial communities. And really, so what all of these interventions are playing on is this strong association between AMR and conjugation. And this is especially important in, well, in enteric bacteria and also in, in One Health settings. Does that, does that, answer, does that answer your question, Jonathan? <laughs> well, yes, I, I mean, it's, um, th thank you. Um, I mean, I think that the, in the increase in, in MRSA and, and, and followed by the, the decrease, uh, you know, the, the, there, there's ST239, as you mentioned, ST5, ST8, the same kind of thing has actually been observed in multiple places where okay. there is an increase in population prevalence and a decrease. And you're totally yeah. right that there are shifting yeah. uh, populations and it's interesting to think about what's yeah. driving that shift yeah, yeah. In, in which in which strains are dominant in different populations. And yeah. I haven't seen you know compelling answer yet as to why there's been a decrease, at least in the U.S. in SD5. Um, yeah. uh, yes, SD8 has been stable, uh, yeah. but SD5 has gone down. And there are all sorts of interesting hypotheses from shifts in antimicrobial use to the possibility of you know, different bacteriophage blooms or, yeah. um, or host immunity. But, but I, yeah, so I, I haven't seen a compelling answer on that yet. I'm just curious yeah. for, your, for, your for, for, for SD239, I think that, you know, we found at least decent evidence that it's that it was very costly, but it may be the outlier. It's got this gigantic, you know, it's got this gigantic SCC mech, uh, you know, or, or this, you know, cassette. So it's, um, but the others, I do think that's a good question. I do think at that level, you know, that evolutionary biology has been very focused at the kind of level that I talked about today, but what really drives the rise and fall of these lineages, I think is a, is a question that we haven't really often got at, not only in, not only in Staph aureus, but in other pathogens as well. Thank you. That was great, Craig. Awesome. Um, some more questions came in actually. Uh, so, um, Marcia Osborne is, asks, um, Kind of a big question. So if cutting back on antibiotic use doesn't eliminate MCR1 type factors, um, how can this be realistically addressed? Um, yeah. So I think the first thing I want to say is cutting back on antibiotic use definitely helps. I worry I was too harsh on it, but I think there's this idea, look, it's costly. You stop using the antibiotic. Will resistance go away? And that's something that's really hard to do with antibiotics that you're using to treat people, okay? There've never been really big interventions where you really just stop using antibiotics at, at anything like that, you know, a national scale like there was with Colistin where it just, you know, all of a sudden there was a 90% decrease. Um, and, and so I think the idea is that if, if, if you can't rely on fitness costs alone to get rid of it, you have to do something else to make it go away. And so these were the population, these were the population genetic engineering approaches that I talked about. Gotcha. Um, I think there is, yeah, there's an one, maybe, maybe one last question that's more coming. Um, it seems that many surface, so oh, Tracy Riveo asks, um, it seems that many surface associated adaptations in pathogens uh, that aid survival in the host could potentially predispose to ac acquisition of further AMR. Are there other similar examples you're aware of? Um, uh, this is where you catch me out that I don't know that much about about bacteria actually about vir about virulence. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say no. I, I I don't know. I mean, in general, when I think about things that are gonna predispose bacteria to acquiring AMR, there's some obvious things. So things, for example, that are good hosts for mobile genetic elements. Things that lack xenogenetic defense mechanisms like CRISPR-Cas, these are going to be things that are going to be more likely to acquire resistance genes by horizontal transfer. Um, but it's more than that. So there have been times that we've done some other studies that I didn't talk about, where we've looked at, at determinants, at genes, not genes that actually confer resistance, but genes that confer the ability to evolve resistance. And, and we found actually some really cool and interesting and subtle and, and hidden cases where, you know, it's genes that you might not think would play any role in AMR, um, but that actually play really important roles in the, in the evolution of AMR. 
So that's, I hope that answers your question. I think so, cool. Um, okay, so it looks like that, that we've actually addressed um, pretty much all the questions. So um, on behalf of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, let's thank Professor McLean again uh, for joining us today and giving a really fantastic talk and uh, extended discussion. Uh, please do get in touch with any of the seminar organize organizers if you have further questions for our speaker. Uh, also check out the CCDD website to stay up to date on upcoming seminars and other events. Next week's seminar will be given by Professor uh, Kate Grubowski from Johns Hopkins, and she'll be talking about the epidemiological and evolutionary dynamics of HIV in Uganda. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, bye, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye.